Hello, everyone, and welcome to Office Hours. As always, this is where we gather every single day to help anyone and everyone who shows up uh, to talk about modern web-based production. It's where you can submit questions about media creation and distribution in all of its forms. You can do that 24-7. Uh, if you want to pop in a question uh, any time of the day, the easiest way is to use the QR code that I will pop up on the screen here. Uh, that works all the time and gets you kind of into the quick links. Now, if you'd like to get a little deeper, you can use our Mukana interface. The Mukana interface has a couple of extra features, the most important of which is that you can vote on the questions that are submitted by everyone to the show every day. Your votes do count because the ones that gets the most votes, we speak of them longer and in more depth. Uh, so that's how kind of the system works. But if you just want to get a quick question in any time, day or night, wake up in the middle of the night and go, hmm, wonder how that works. Toss it in through this QR code and it'll eventually get into the show and appear alongside everything else. All right. That is how the process works. It is time to get into the regular show, which means that Jason, I believe you're reading today. What's our first question? I sure am. Uh, Francis Fry in Cambridge, Massachusetts writes in, while the Blackmagic Ethernet switch is not yet available, do you have a recommendation for an easy-to-use 10 gigabit substitute? And I have your name down here, Jason. You're going to help us out a little I bit? I do indeed. So nothing's going to be quite as easy for Blackmagic um, with Blackmagic than Blackmagic, I suppose. Um, but I'd say a Netgear AV switch you pretty much can't go wrong with. Am I hearing? There we go. Uh, yeah, I've been hearing about Netgear switches forever, and it seems like they're very reliable, and everybody uh, talks about them with glowing reports. So hopefully that'll take care of it, Francis. Let's move to our next question. Zach Stallsmith in Chautauqua, New York, writes in, I'm seriously considering purchasing a Mac, a Mac Mini M2 Pro for video and audio editing, as well as everyday use. What pros and cons should I be aware of with this machine? Courtney, start us off. Well, one thing is, if you're seriously considering it, uh, getting the M2, I'd wait a month because the new M4 Mac Minis with a different form factor and plus uh, some NPU AI processing cores will be in there. Uh, a little more of them, I guess. Uh, so I would wait a month or so before uh, making that decision. And then, then you can decide when you see the new ones that are out. I think they're going to be announced next month or the end of this month even probably next month in October. Uh, so take a look at the specs on both and see if there's anything you're going to gain by waiting uh, a month. And otherwise, that also is a good time to buy an M2 if you decide the M2 will do it for you. Uh, then they'll be cheaper because they'll probably be discounted about 100 bucks uh, as soon as the new one comes out. So I would wait uh, before you pull the trigger on that one. Jesse, what do you think? Uh, I'm just going to bang through the pros and the cons. The pros are you're getting pretty good bang for the buck on the uh, Mac Mini. You've also got really decent I.O. for a unit that size. Uh, the cons are you've got fixed RAM, so when you're buying, you're going to want to get as much RAM as you can afford. You've got a fixed locked hard drive inside, so when you're buying, you're going to want to get as large a hard drive as you can afford, and that does push the price up, and <laughs> that's where Apple products kind of lose their bang for the buck is hard drive and RAM cost. Uh, yeah, I think I uh, I go along with that. I mean, it, a lot of people, a Mac Mini is all the computer they'll ever need. Um, if you don't do a lot of work on the road and you're going to be in a fixed installation, I think it's a it's a really sterling thing. Uh, you know, once upon a time, in order to do video and audio editing, you needed a really, really high spec machine. Those days are long gone. And I've been surprised even my relatively modestly configured machines can still cut through standard video and standard audio. Uh, if you get up into 8K and stuff like that, you suddenly go, well, maybe I should have uh, gone for something bigger. But the practical value of that stuff is for people with special needs. Most of the video right now that's being watched, being consumed, is being consumed off of YouTube and channels like that. And, you know, 1920 by 1080 or or 4K at best will get you everything you need for that. And most of these systems do a really good job with that. So you don't have to go overboard. So I think you'd probably be really happy with that for a long time. Zach, keep your fingers crossed and let us know how you decide to jump. Let's go to our next question. 
Coming in on the QR code, our own Guy Cochran in Seattle, Washington writes in, what other cameras does the new Canon C80 compare with? Oh, there's another Canon camera. Exciting, Jesse. Yes. At the top of the hour, every hour, some company releases a camera at this point. <laughs> um, it depends. It depends on which direction you want to go. If what you're looking for is a full frame uh, sensor, like anything in the Sony Alpha series could compare to this camera. Uh, I think what this camera is really built for is kind of those, uh, it, it's a lower end competitor to the box cameras like the, you know, uh, you know the, the, the big boys, the Alexas and stuff. I do not know, I haven't seen if this camera is uh, progressive shutter or rolling shutter, but if it's progressive, then that really narrows the pool of competition. But anything with EOS and then the letter C and whatever numbers come after that would be a fair bit of competition for this camera. But what's its competition? Uh, stuff previously released in the uh, Canon library. Courtney, your thoughts? I was just looking at the specs of it, and it, it's a 6K full frame. Uh, I didn't look at whether it's a global shutter or a rolling shutter. Uh, probably a progressive or rolling shutter at the $5,500 range. That's for the body alone without a lens. So you can put, put cinema lenses on it with an adapter. Uh, it is a full frame multi layer. Uh, uh, stacked sensor that's a CMOS sensor that's in there and it has a very broad range of uh, uh, of ISOs from 100 to like 102,000 or something outrageous uh, but you can imagine there's probably a lot of noise in there and it's a 6k sensor so it's probably com comparative to you know maybe your 6k Blackmagic 6k uh, and in that other cameras in that price range, it has a lot of nice features on it. Uh, it shoots 4K 120, I think. Uh, so it, it does uh, do some uh, high-end stuff with the HEVC uh, codec on it. But I don't think it'll shoot raw at that rate. It depends on the cards. It takes two SD cards in it. So you can ping pong, uh, I think, between uh, cards one to the next so that you can uh, keep rolling without having to run out of PP. Yeah. Do you know uh, what formats it shoots in? Is it all, is it, um, you said it doesn't shoot raw. It can shoot raw at different uh, rates. I don't ah. think it can shoot 4K raw. Ah. Well, uh, 4K, not at uh, that high a, a frame rate. But uh, And which version of raw does it say, whether it shoots ProRes raw or Blackmagic raw or any of those, or is it just Canon's kind of proprietary? The only reason I'm bringing that up is that I just had helped somebody on the internet the other day and they were concerned about, they had a shot that was not particularly well lit. And so it I was suggesting that if they had shot it in raw, they can do a lot more in recovering the faces of the people in the shot. It was brightly backlit. The faces were very dull because they weren't lit. They hadn't reflected or used any light on them. And so um, if you get in those kind of circumstances, raw can kind of save your bacon. Uh, in terms of putting a window over somebody's face and bringing it up a good little bit, but uh, yeah, and looking at the specs here, it, it uh, shoots. Uh, this is internal, and, and there's going to be a difference between internal and external because internal mm -hmm. you're going to be limited to the speed of that SD card that you got in there. Uh, Cinema Raw Light 12 bit, uh, and it's plus at HEV you know, long compression, you can go up to 120 frames per second uh, using the compressed, you know. Uh, long GOP, you know, the long GOP codex in here. You got XF AVCS Intra, which is an intra frame codec. Uh, it's still compressed. Uh, raw, like at the top, there was at the raw, Cinema Raw, 12-bit, uh, 639 megabits per second, I guess. So that's, your cards have to be able to handle that. Uh, so you probably, and I don't, let me see if it has external Let's see, external recording modes, SDI, B, and C. Well, I guess whatever you hook it up to, uh, you know, it has SDI, uh, B, and C out, HDMI out, and USB out for uh, basically 4K out. So, uh, Yeah, just think about your workflow and think about whether or not those formats that it shoots, whether you're going to be able to drag it into whatever NLE's timeline you're using, whether you're shooting, you know, you might be editing on Avid or Blackmagic or Apple or uh, Premiere, any, any of those. Just make sure that if you're interested in quick turnaround, you don't have to do a lot of transcoding with whatever format that camera is doing. Most of the time, and this has been a thing with Canon cameras, uh, going back to my days of the 5Ds, at the beginning of a new camera's release, sometimes the codecs are not 
easily readable by certain NLEs, and all of them have different problems with different codecs. Typically, four or five months later, the engineers at Canon get in there and they work with Apple or Adobe or somebody, and they figure it out how to how to directly bring those files into a timeline. And suddenly you're not in transcoding land anymore. You don't have to have that intermediate mezzanine step to get it out of the format the camera shot to into something that your NLE speaks natively and works quickly with. So just pay attention to uh, to that. If, it, if that particular raw format is something you want to work at, talk to people when this gets out. Or maybe there's a news shooter article that I see somebody listed in here. Uh, they usually do a pretty good breakdown and maybe they'll talk about the post workflow for you so that you know that you're not going to get that unnecessary extra step in the middle should quick turnaround be something that you're looking for. All of them, no matter what they're shooting in, there will be some way to transcode what it shoots into what you can use in your NLE, just whether that's convenient or less convenient and how long it takes them to make it more convenient if they decide to. All right. Uh, next question. Francis Fry in Cambridge, Massachusetts asks, with a 10 gig internet connection, which backup solution would, would you use if simplicity was the goal? You don't tell us anything about your computer system or anything else. Uh, a, a lot of the, uh, you know, I use iCloud for most of my, I, I, there's a backup. <laughs> I'm actually spacing on the name of it. I've had it running for so long. Uh, but it does automatic backups. Uh, in the Apple system. Knowledge at NAS? Or, oh, you mean a time capsule, yeah? Yeah, time capsule. That's right. It's just oh, doing that's... constant backups wow. and you can I set it. I check up on that, Bill. That's, that's very, <laughs> very out of date. Yeah, but it's been working fine forever. And I very seldom have to go there because everything is, is pretty uh, stable. I think I've used it twice in the past six years to go recover something off of it. Uh, anyway... But you're right. So, so uh, Synology is a big name in, in those kind of backup solutions. Anything else that anybody else knows about that you want to recommend? I mean, if you're doing backup to the cloud, uh, you know, if and all the backup systems are pretty smart. It takes a long time to index and backup everything, but then it's just going to look at what's changed since the last backup and kind of refresh the files. It doesn't replace everything every time. So, Courtney, your thoughts? Yeah, if you're talking about uh, cloud backup, uh, because if we're talking about 10 gig uh, inter internet connection, not just a local area network uh, backups, uh, Frame.io, you know, any of the professional type uh, uh, management systems, uh, you know, file management systems for media files uh, would probably serve you pretty well. Most of them may not even be able to handle 10 gigabit, you know, that depends. Uh, up and, and writing. So check and see uh, if you're looking at a service, a cloud type service, see what their maximum uh, bit rate would be if if you can hit them with near 10 gigabits, uh, if they can accept at that rate, because you're always limited by the rate at which the cloud storage will accept your data. And if you can send it at 10, uh, you know, I doubt they'll be able to accept it at 10 because they're serving multiple clients, but check that and that will be your bottleneck or limiting factor. Yeah. Um, let's go to the next question. Robert Shoji in Los Angeles, California writes in, any comments on the new Aperture Storm 1200X? Oh, Aperture has a big light. Is that what I'm hearing about 1200? Jesse, how, how strong is this monster? Uh, look, I started my career when we still had the <laughs> filament bulbs. And That's right. we, Tungsten we live forever. In the future. This is amazing. Because <laughs> <laughs> I'm comparing this to that that world. Where here's the big thing about the difference is when you had those old lights, the only way you were changing the color was by subtracting light. So you always were bringing down the power of the light if you wanted to have a different color than that native tungsten color. Um, so this is just the future for where we're at. This is what we're talking about is the Aperture on the Aperture Storm 1200X. Um, these names are... are <laughs> the X is important. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you don't get anywhere without the X at this point. Um, is that a, a comp? Is that a chip on board? Uh, it's, single it's, chip? Yep, yep. Uh, multiple yep. colors. So they've got, where is it? Um, 
you know, they, they've got the the uh, daylight and tungsten, but they've also got cyan, magenta, whatever, whatever. However, they're breaking down the colors, so you've got the full spectrum. I'm assuming the 1200 comes from uh, 1200 different colors that you can create by <laughs> mixing the different. Not 1200 LEDs. watts. Maybe it's a 1200 watt cooler. <laughs> <laughs> and the X's for all the colors you get. Anyway, that's what it is. It's fantastic. It's just, it's so wonderful to live in the future where we have LEDs instead of tungsten bulbs. It, yeah, thumbs up. Yeah. You'll get a couple of things there. I looked at it and just on that brief, it looks like it has a Bowens mount, which is really useful because Bowens, although the company is no longer in business, their mounting system was so wildly popular that there's a gazillion accessories you can put on the front of something like that to be able to to use it with... Uh, all sorts of snoots and and reflectors and um, rings that you can mount soft boxes to and things like that. So in that respect, those things are very very useful. Um, chip on board is nice because instead of an LED array, which is very hard to cut, that'll send out a, an individual uh, source of light that you can use barn doors and things like that with, and that functions correctly. So all those things. I mean, it, you're buying a big strong light. And that has a set of uses. Uh, in some cases, it doesn't work well. I mean, if you're trying to do a moody scene, you may dial that back to, to 5% and it still gives you too much light because cameras are getting more and more sensitive to light all the time. And you get those models from places like Canon and others that are so sensitive that they work almost in darkness or candlelight. So if you have a big, strong light like this, it can kind of overpower some of those new uh, sensors. But boy, if you get into things where you have to light a warehouse and you have to throw a ton of light to brighten up a big dark area, these things are the cat's meow. We used to have to use what, what were called HMIs back in the day to get that kind of light output out of a small fixture. And they were hot and expensive and complicated to use. Courtney, you had some more thoughts? Yeah, and they made funny noises in your soundtracks. Uh, they sure did. Well. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, this uses uh, this is kind of new. Instead of bicolor light, like you will find most of, of the chip on board uh, bicolor lights out there that use just a a warm white and a and a daylight balanced uh, set of LEDs. This is a five color engine that uses blue, lime, amber, indigo, and red LEDs. Combines them all together, and you come up with uh, a full spectrum of white light uh, hmm. with that combination. So you can generate a lot of colors in between. So you can throw that packages of gels that have been sitting on the back of your grip box for many years away. And you can Stop just talking the about me. Whatever gel light. If you want to make that cyan slash on the back wall, perfect uh, thing for that. Uh, or you want to make it red or green or yellow. Anything. anything does it list at like. CRI? How, how, how I was looking, color it says high CRI. It's high CRI, but they like don't give you a number, high, do they? High CRI. It's, it's high very high. Uh, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what the uh, typically it CRI really is the color rendering index to when you're ninety-five somewhere in there probably ninety-five. Yeah. Okay, that that's probably acceptable. I you know pure pure forms of light like the sun gives you yeah, kind of if a you hundred. are shooting you know the next sequel to the Dune series um, and you need to <laughs> actually have the sun. I think this light is perfect. <laughs> Yeah. Hey, well, it's expensive. And and so those kind of lights, I mean, I would expect something professional grip gear at that level. You're talking about, what, $2,500 for a single light head? I would expect it to be up in that category. I've used lights like the, the light panels, Geminis and things like that, that cost that much. They are a joy to work with in the field because everything is highly tested. They work well. Uh, you say, you know, I've been in circumstances where I just need to turn it down 3% to get a shadow back. And you just go over and turn it and it's exactly what you wanted. And then you go right back to getting your work done. You don't have to worry about finding scrims or gels or all the old stuff. In that respect, those lights can be really, really useful in professional workflow and save you a lot of time. But and it is the uh, other side of it. It does have uh, IP65 weather protection, and that's important if you're going to do any exteriors and yeah. a rainstorm comes up. But even the control box and the cable connections are have sealed connectors on them, so they're, they're going to keep any rain or moisture out. I wouldn't operate this underwater, but IP65, <laughs> uh, but it's not going to explode or short out or go nuts you know, if a rainstorm comes up and catches the, uh, catches the instrument out sitting on a stand with a rake. 
Those cobs are pretty uh, efficient, too. Does it say anything about its power draw at full output? Maybe it's 1,200 watt equivalent, but uh, it doesn't say what the... I'm looking yeah, for the, the amperage of my entire house. That's basically <laughs> what it is. Yeah, I'm sure it doesn't pull more than 15 amps, but... Uh, no, so it, most yeah. of these are made for plugging into a regular yeah. household circuit. They'll work with that, so, yeah. Well, there's some thoughts for you, Robert. It looks like a good light, and Aperture is known to be a pretty reliable and solid company. So, Aperture, I keep forgetting. There's It's one of those names. There's too many forms of the same word. Let's go to the next question. Andy Kokendorfer in Vieira, Florida, writes in, What dimensions should you make a QR code when displayed on a screen, assuming 1920 by 1080 video resolution? Jesse, what do you got? Uh, it depends. And the reason it depends is because uh, we don't know what this is going out to. So we don't know what your target audience is and what they're going to be watching on. So if they're watching on, you know, on their iPad or his phone, um, or windowed and crunched down, or over Zoom and compressed beyond that 1920 by 1080. You want to make it bigger. But what you'd want to do is, uh, assuming they're watching at 1920 by 1080 on a full screen monitor or something like that, you would want to test it. Just build your little bugs, drop them in the corner, and see where your phone can reach or wh what your phone can read. And the other question we have is, uh, how far away from their monitor are they when they're when they're scanning this? So if, if they're sitting, I'm two feet away from my monitors on my computer, you could make it, you know, five, 10% the size of, of the screen, and I could still read it just fine. But if I'm sitting across the living room, um, you'd, you'd want to make it even bigger. So it, so many, it depends. Just test, 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 and see what your phone can read and what not your phone can read. So get some not the newest iPhones and try to scan that QR code with some, you know, with some, some other phones and then settle on a size. Courtney? I think a good general rule of thumb is, and I see this in broadcasting, is a third of the smallest dimension of the screen, a third of the height of a 16 by 9, in other words, or a quarter of the width of the 16 width, uh, would be a good rule, a place to start. So you see a lot of lower thirds that have QR codes in them, so you know that it's a third of the height of the screen. Uh, it can fit in the third of the height of the screen, usually is a is a size that can be uh, you know seen clearly by a phone at a, a normal viewing distance. If it's something that's going to go on you know, uh, social media where it's going to be viewed on a phone, same thing, only turn it 90 degrees so that it's vertical. Uh, a third of the height of the screen, uh, of the long side of the screen, would then be probably appropriate if you're going to go on social media. Or if it's like if you're using it as a QR code for a ticket for an entry, like, you know, a movie ticket, entry to a venue or something uh, where you're going to send out a custom QR code to each individual person, then you want to make it as... as uh, uh, pretty large so that uh, it's easy to scan off of somebody's phone uh, at the venue. So you, in that case, you want to make it uh, probably about 50% uh, of the width of the phone or a third of the height of the phone. Jason. Uh, there's another, it depends. Uh, it's important to remember that the length of the web address that you're going to be embedding in there or the data writ large that you're going to be embedding in there directly relates to the complexity of the QR code. QR, of course, is quick response. And the um, amount of redundancy that is built into the QR code is um, something you have to pay attention to. So if you've got a, a long web address, you're going to have to make the QR code much larger in order to get the same amount of failover and manipulation, um, you know, with a much simpler web address. So be sure that you use a link shortener. Oh, there you go. That makes sense. Jesse, you wanted to come back in? Be sure that you use a trusted link shortener. The yes. other thing I wanted to mention is um, the, the duration that it's on the screen is probably going to end up being more important than the size of the QR code. So if it's up for, you know, five, 10 seconds, it doesn't matter how big it is. Nobody has the time to get out their phone. So you want to be uh, programming a long, a long stretch when you're, when you're putting that up on the screen. I'll, I'll support that. I did a lecture not long ago where I had a screen and I had four QR codes on it and only one, it, it, it was a long, narrow room. So the the distance to most of the audience was reasonable. And I watched as I threw it up and I said, if anybody wants to view these old shows, uh, here's four of them you can check out. And I saw people reach in, pull out their phones, invoke the camera, 
uh, then uh, hold it up and then pinch and zoom and try to get it there and then try to stabilize it so they got a clean shot. That whole process sometimes took 10 seconds, sometimes I think the longest one, it seems like it took about 30 to 40 seconds because somebody wasn't quite sure they wanted to do it. Then they were fumbling to find their phone. And I, I agree 100% that you kind of have to know who you're going to display this for. It was easier the next time I had a, a group of QR codes saying, I just told them ahead of time, hey, pull your phones out if you're interested in this topic. There'll be some QR codes coming up in just a minute. And by the time I got to that, anybody who was interested had already pulled their phones out and they didn't need anywhere near as much time. So it depends on your presentation too and how you structure them into that. Let's go to the next question. Speaking of QR codes, Tom Emmon in San Francisco used one to ask, I've had problems with the cache on my ATEM filling up, suddenly out of the blue, but the same thing would happen using OBS to stream instead of the ATEM. Sounds like a network problem, not the ATEM. Cache? I'm, I, hmm. I, and this is going to be completely useless to me giving you any advice because I power down my ATEM and reprovision it every single time I use it. So I'm always fresh with the data and the cache never gets any bigger. Jesse, what are your thoughts? I think this is a reply to a question we addressed yesterday. I think it was Alex or two days ago, Alexander asked this um, about the ATEM. We have had this cache issue, but we've only ever had it at the start of a stream. So if we're not getting a good connection between the ATEM and the platform that's pushing the, the information out to the audience, the cache will just uh, you know be a vertical line and then the whole thing crashes. Uh, we haven't had this happen in the middle of a broadcast, but it sounds like that has happened. And I think Alexander initiated this conversation. So um, uh, let's let's remember to to bump this. The, you know, let, let's remember to uh, next time he's on the show. Let's ask him about his experience and see if we can kind of you know uh, form our cloud of understanding of of where this is happening. This problem sounds like a very good idea. Sometimes these kind of problems can be hard to diagnose because there's just so many variables involved. So I, I support your thought entirely, Jesse. Let's go on to the next question. Uh, whoops, lost it. There it is. Kern in Maine says, using a Sennheiser 416 connected to an XLR H1 handle unit on the Sony FX30. Cameras connected to an ATEM Mini Pro ISO. Is there a method to get the audio to the ATEM without having to record at the same time? Currently, it only works if recording. Hmm. Courtney? That sounds very odd. Uh, uh, check your settings on that Sony camera. So you're, if you're feeding the microphone into the uh, penthouse uh, audio adapter that's on the top of the handle, the FX30, it should be going into the camera and it should be coming out on the HDMI output. Make sure that there's in the settings of that camera that audio is available on the clean HDMI out on that, which is then feeding to the ATEM. And then of course on the ATEM, you just go to that input from the FX30 and you click the on button for the audio uh, or audio follows video, but on button. And then it should have audio on it whenever the camera is on and the audio is on, not necessarily when you're pressing the record button on the uh, camera. Sometimes this is called E to E, uh, where it means that the uh, electronically the input is piped to the output uh, even before you start recording. Uh, so check that and make sure that you have it set uh, in the, look in the menus to see if audio is output over the HDMI from the input. So I think that may be what the problem is, unless there's something quirky about the FX30 that doesn't power, doesn't power up the microphone unless you hit the record button. So that's, that's very odd. Yeah, sometimes there's a physical switch in there to turn on phantom power. The the 416 obviously needs some kind of juice to uh, operate correctly. Um, what else was I thinking about? Just also remember, I mean, I don't, I, I, I'm presuming, and this is for people, if Kern is, if you're highly uh, skilled at this, then ignore what I'm about to say. But for the new people who are 
coming in here. Just remember that shotgun microphones is kind of one of the weirdest things, weirdest descriptions of something because unlike shotguns they do not reach out and grab sound better uh that is impossible in the world of physics the sound is going to start away from you and it's going to travel over space to get to that microphone capsule and the more space there is between you and the source of the sound the lower its level is going to be and there's just no way you can really get around that the, the way people get around it is put wireless mic on the talent to get the microphone capsule closer. The reason I'm saying that is that um, people do have this idea that mounting that type of mic on a camera is going to reach farther, and it really won't. So you want a clean microphone. That's a, that's a very good microphone for doing those kind of things, but understand its limitations. If you can zoom with your feet, in other words, walk closer to your subject rather than zooming with the zoom lens, it will improve your audio in all circumstances if you're using an on-camera microphone. I always consider the on-camera microphone the worst placement that I could possibly have to deal with. So I try to avoid it whenever I can. Jason, you have some other thoughts? Yeah, this really sounds like a camera routing issue or, and I guess I'll just cover the bases, um, on the ATEM, is it uh, is the audio channel faded up and turned on? And is the level correct? Is it set for line level, um, you know, for the correct input uh, to be on all the time instead of just being on, um, what is it called? Uh, uh, yeah, uh, audio follows video, right? So hmm. it would only be on when it's on. But like the FX30 also may have some routing because keep in mind, most high-end video cameras, of course, have their own way of routing. For example, you might want to be doing pre roll into your headphones only and not have that go out over a live stream or live HDMI feed. Um, I don't have an FX30, so I can't really speak to that, but I am really certain this is a routing issue. Yeah. Courtney, some more thoughts? Yeah, I looked up on the manual. <laughs> hey, RTFM, here it is. HDMI output settings uh, in the manual for the FX30. It says you, you have to set the video and audio to be output to an external recorder player connected via HDMI when shooting a movie. So you set it in movie mode and set it to output, uh, external output, HDMI output settings, and you go to the desired item there and you set it to uh, media recording, external media. And so that will set it uh, so that it will output the audio over the HDMI, which is the, the setting that it has to be in if you're using an external uh, HDMI recorder, external recorder connected to the HDMI. Obviously, it has to have the audio embedded in the HDMI. So you put it into that mode, and then your ATEM should be able to see it without actually having to go into record on the camera itself. And for those of you just starting out, this is why we read manuals, <laughs> Courtney. <laughs> It actually has useful information there. Sometimes it specifically can handle your, your particular concern. Uh, let's go to the next question. Zach Stallsmith in Chautauqua, New York writes in, can anyone think of any issues when installing loopback on school MacBooks that IT departments wouldn't like? I want to showcase it to them to make classroom audio playback better. Thanks. Jason, what do you think? Oh, boy. It, it depends. As long as the MacBooks are... Apple Silicon MacBooks, and they are running the most current version of Mac OS, and you have the most current version of Loopback, um, they're going to have to turn on and enable um, a little bit in the background, but it's much, much easier than, um, than it used to be. Long story short, they won't find anything objectionable about the app directly, aside from the fact that if they don't understand it, it you know, Loopback can cause a lot of problems for someone who, who isn't expecting it. Yeah, the one thing I would think is that if you're going to go into um, a, an institutional uh, system like that, document it for them. And and I'm not saying that just because uh, the next person who has to deal with that system will appreciate it. I'm also saying it because if you learn that when you make changes on a global globally accessible system, leaving behind a little documentation. You'll get used to doing that. And I think that's a very valuable skill. I, When I've hired people in the past, uh, one of the things I occasionally mention is, can you talk about something you changed that was interesting and how did you document it? Because passing along that information, I mean, if you're making this system non-standard, the next uh, helper, technician, service person who comes in and is going to look at it and go, what the heck? What is this loopback thing and how does it work and why? And if there's no note anywhere as to what you did and why you did it, 
it becomes harder to kind of figure that out. Uh, and half the time, in my experience, they say, let's just rip all this stuff out and put in a new system that I understand. That's, that's a technician's uh, solution sometimes to something that has so much customization they can't really understand it. My two cents anyway. Next question. Paul Walhus writes in from Austin, Texas, all the fluff and hype aside, what is really useful and relevant from yesterday's Apple Glow event and can be used on current Apple iPhones, watches, etc.? cetera? Uh, Jesse, start us off. Oh, boy. Um, I, I'm not convinced that needed to be 90 minutes long. Uh, all the fluff and hype aside, you're not left with too much. And I think the real the real thing that's going on here is uh, the reason that there's not that much to talk about uh, looking backwards is because they have a, a product that they want to launch. And it's not the iPhone. It's Apple Intelligence. And we're going to see a pretty clear split between phones that can do Apple intelligence and the, you know, the scraps that they're going to toss the older, the older, uh, the older phones um, of what Apple intelligence could be like if you upgraded the phone. So I don't think in this cycle they're looking back that much. Uh, I think they're more trying to make a case for everybody buying the next generation of phone to have access to the new tools. Courtney? Yeah, I mean, you know, it's the uh, spinal tap rule. It goes one, goes to eleven. Uh, yeah, there's very little difference. I went, I went online and Apple. You can do this as well, and Apple's site, so you know it's working off their data and not somebody else's. So uh, this is the 16 Pro versus the 15 Pro here in the left two sides. So you see, it has the same number of uh, neural network engines in it so it's used on whenever they come out with apple intelligence that actually works uh that'll be the same between the 15 and the 16. uh the main difference is, is the little uh the little touch uh controller for the camera that's on the side so that's one thing that you get on the new one that you don't have on the old one uh yeah it's a convenient fi feature if you put a case on it we don't know if it's going to work or not has macro photography on the old one it has 48 megapixel has a better camera for macro photography on the newer one uh and it does dolby vision up to 4k at 120 when the previous version didn't uh and it will take spatial photos and videos so uh that's one little difference the rest of it it's you know, mainly about a 20% uh, increase in battery or 10% increase in battery life, uh, you know, between 23 hours and 27 hours, Whoopee. you know, and <laughs> the rest of everything is pretty much uh, the same from, you know, uh, phone to phone from last year's model to this year's model. So you're not getting, you got about a 10% improvement. And if those improvements on that, that ease of ease of use of the camera app by using the little, the new haptic uh, uh, touch button on the top is uh, something you're interested in. If you take a lot of pictures, you might want to go for the upgrade, but it's an expensive upgrade. But I might point out that they are offering up to, depending upon the shape of your phone, $800 rebate if you turn in last year's model to them. Uh, so you can get $800 off if you give them your old phone. But usually most people like to hold on to their old ones or hand them down, give them to the little woman or the kids. You know. So this is me as kind of an Apple fanboy. Um, it's I usually skip a generation. I did last time. I'm still on an iPhone um, 14 Pro. And so I skipped 15, a little bit upset because I missed the USB-C port, which I really think is the future. And so that was something I wanted, but I thought I'll just hold off. So I may uh, dive into this one. To me, the way Apple does things, they were the first company and other companies have done this too, but they were the first company to me that has this, the, the brand new we're going to get it really close to what it should be. We're going to ship it. We're going to get all the feedback. And then we're going to iterate and iterate and iterate through software based on the new capabilities of the chips and the pathways through the phone and its intelligence and everything else. And they don't try to make what they used to do. They used to do the new phone had to be kind of baked and it was done. So it had to have everything in there the day it launched. I don't see that as much, but it's been weird for my brain because I keep now getting all these new iteration features. And at some point, those new iteration improvements, particularly in software and utility that 
used to come out only when the new phone comes out. Now it comes out with software updates. So it's constantly getting little refinements in, and some of them are meaningless to me. Some of them have proved to be meaningful to me. And when I find something that's meaningful to me, it, it often takes this path for me. Happened to me when I was at Comic-Con two years ago when I was shooting photos. And I shot a photo, uh, Quima Amidala against some windows, L really liked the photos. And I was scrolling through it and I, my finger lingered for some reason on her photo. And all of a sudden this glowing rim around her appeared. And it turned out that it was using its then AI process to cut a mat out of the photo because it could tell that this was a subject. It wasn't a depth photo. It was just a photo, but it somehow figured out this is the outline of the person you're tapping on. And it trained me that that was a feature that I didn't even know was sitting there. And so I started using it and I found, you know, a bunch of things that were really useful about it. That had probably been on my phone for six months before I stumbled into it. And that to me is how my interaction with Apple's hardware and software, and particularly their phones, keeps going. They will ship the phone. I won't even know some of the stuff it does. I don't study them and try to figure out. I typically just keep doing what I did with the old one until I either read about something or I stumble upon a discovery like that. And I go, oh, that's useful for me. Or maybe I see a little blurb go by or somebody on TV talking about it. Then I go back to the phone that I've already had for a while. And I say, does mine do that? And sure enough, about half the time, because I usually skip a generation, I find, oh, it does do that. I could use that. So let me try it. So I just don't see these, particularly phones, they're such a central part of our lives. I see them as evolving devices. And by not upgrading, I'm going to be cut off at some point from an evolution because that phone doesn't have the AI chip or the security chip or something that they've added maybe a couple of generations ago that I haven't been using that I'm going to want to use now because suddenly I found a relevant use for it. That's just how I interact with my phone and my technology. You may be totally different. You may not use any of the same things I do. And every phone may work exactly like this, and I just don't know about it. This is just something in my experience with my iPhones. Courtney, dive in some more. Yeah, I found a couple of other dis, uh, differences. It, it does do Dolby Vision uh, up to 120 slow-mo if you're external recording. You can't, can't record internally at that rate. Uh, but it also has a difference in the audio. Um, <clears throat> the new one has studio quality, <clears throat> studio quality for mic array uh, with wind noise reduction. And they demoed that in the video uh, where it uh, basically, you know, automatically filters out low frequency stuff but i tell you if wind is blowing on those little uh electret condenser microphone uh, or mims microphone elements in there they're going to be bottoming out that capsule and even though you can uh filter out the low frequency thumps or thuds you're not it's not going to be recording any high frequency sounds while that low frequency uh while that wind noise is bottoming out that microphone so and with four microphones built into the uh the body of the phone itself, it's going to be almost impossible to put a windscreen over it without covering up everything else, uh, including your screen and or your camera. So uh, since it's impossible to put a windscreen on the internal microphones, it'd be best to use an external microphone if you're going to go out and do any type of professional recording uh, or even blogging stuff. You'd probably want to use a wireless mic plugged into the bottom of the phone anyway, so where you can put some wind protection on it. So this this ability to reduce the wind is okay for casual casual photos and bloggers who don't want to take the time or money to plug in an external microphone to it. I will say I have no experience with it, but if what they showed in the in the keynote yesterday about that process, you know, almost every software program that I'm using now has some form of automated uh, intelligent handling of noise reduction, uh, separating the speaking person from the background. In the implementation they showed yesterday of how they are working with that, it's interesting. I hadn't seen anybody before that is doing this. They're, they're capturing, analyzing, and then separating noise reduction from the original signal and allowing you in their little mix function inside the phone 
to add back in as much or dial out as much in kind of live time as you like of the background. So if you're doing, you know, your little movie and you're doing in, in a restaurant, I think was the example they used on the keynote. And uh, you want some clinking glass backgrounds and people walking around, but not all of it. You have the choice. You can slider over and it's algorithm that's separated the main dialogue from the background noise, you can kill it, kill all the background if that's what you choose to do, or you can leave all the background there, or you can dial in the amount of background you add to it. That's a nice little thing for somebody who wants to shoot that kind of stuff. I probably would have used that in my corporate video meeting, making because I had a lot of scenes that we put in restaurants and things like that. And so if it saves me some time having to recreate or add, you know, background walla that I captured another time. It's just going to save me a little time. Maybe it'll work out fine. It's still still unknown whether it works as they promise, but they're usually pretty good at those kind of features. So we'll see how that kind of stuff works out. Let's go to the next question. Douglas Carmichael writes in, Lavo has introduced Home MC2 DSP, which enables their MC2 control services to use standard x86 virtual services mix engines. Will this be the beginning of a trend amongst console manufacturers? Jeffy, Jesse, what do you think? It's okay. You can call me Jeffy. That's it. My grandmother thought my name was Jeffy for the first two years of my life. Hey, I'm trying to do three things at once. Because she heard it wrong on the phone. So she and I was all thinking of the family uncles, circus Jeffy. where little Jeffy would mm -hmm. run around. Sorry. <laughs> That's okay. Um, it seems like this is uh, taking audio production and using remote servers to process the audio. And we come into the exact, the exact opposite problem of video remote editing and that is that for video it, it's so much bandwidth that you need to move all that video back and forth in real time that it doesn't seem particularly practical to me it seems much more practical to keep everything local the the issue with audio processing is it requires so little processing power it, it i'm curious who needs a remote server to edit their audio that that they're doing that much at that high a level but they can't afford the processing power in studio Okay, thank you for that. Let's move on to the next question. Walt Palmer in Rehoboth Beach, Delaware writes in, suggestions please for a third-party SMS text provider. I currently have automation email in my Verizon text address for my transmitter to silence alarms, but often I receive the text four hours later. Ooh, that's not good with an alarm system. Uh, what do you think, Jason? Yeah, that's pretty terrible. Um, I really like Google Voice. It does have its limitations, but it's inexpensive and um, seems to work pretty well. So give it a shot. There you go. Next question. Paul Walhus in Austin, Texas writes in, Audible wants to use AI trained on professional narrators' voices to generate new audiobook recordings. They will get paid and includes a link. Yeah. Uh, Jesse, what do you think? How much will they get paid? Uh, this, and who will get the gigs? Just the people who've been around for a long time? Is it? Is there a? Is there a listing of how long you've been there, or what? You know, what's the determinant? It's interesting. Uh, Courtney, what do you think? Well, I think for audiobooks, you know, you do a lot of these bills, so I want to hear your I perspective do. on these, uh, because you know, when you're doing an audiobook, it's more than just a flat read. You know, it's you're doing characters, character voices, and the the uh, you know a, vo a a voice that's sampled even by a professional narrator is not going to have all those different character voices. I don't think AI is going to generate those. Maybe they can now. I'm not sure. It depends on uh, whoever is programming it and whoever's sampling it. They're using as a sample to do their AI cloning, uh, and whether or not that you know they'll do. Okay, here's a little old woman voice, and you know they'll they'll do five minutes of recording or ten minutes of recording of their little old woman. Here's my little old man voice. You know, now, here's my little kid voice. So they might have uh, the ability to pre-train uh, pre uh, on different types of characters if you're doing voice books for narrative uh, novels and things. For instructional videos, instructional manu instruction manuals, those kind of stuff, yeah, it's going to work great. At least the, at least the narrator is going to get some money, but it's probably the equivalent of, you know, if you were a 
a narrator uh, selling your own stuff off your website and I mean, a musician selling your own stuff off your website versus marketing your stuff through a bigger record company where you're getting three cents per sale instead of, you know, 70% of the income uh, off of putting it on iTunes or something. You know, Apple's taking the other 30%. But, uh, you know, uh, it's going to be a big difference in the amount of money that's going to be generated for those for those uh, narrators. But the high point is they don't have to spend hours and hours of their day recording those books. Yeah. I, okay. So, uh, yes, I do work in this part of it now. I'm just exploring it. I've only been doing it about a year and a half, two years. I find it fascinating, but it, it's creatively satisfying for me. But it's a weird thing to look at this idea of AI doing it. And I guess I would come to it from this point of view. Um, algorithmic ideas and creativity are in a little bit of conflict, but also um, there's there's ways that they intersect. And I'm interested in how um, large language models, what they pull out of all those training performances and what the coders are going to do in terms of saying, we've reduced all of these samples into a set of rules that recreate them within this range. Um, you know, if you're angry, how angry? If, if the voice needs to be upset, that's something that an actor or actress uh, will figure out. They'll, they'll know where to go. And I, here's one thing I've learned as a narrator uh, in these things. Some of it is very counterintuitive. I'll never forget I had, I was reading something that was written by one of the best narrators out there for audiobooks, a guy named Scott Brick. And he was talking, somebody said, so the action's getting uh, more intense and we're getting to the big climax of this scene. So I, I started picking up my pace and he said, well, stop for a minute. Think about it. When I get to that point, I don't pick up my pace. I slow down. If the listener has become engaged in the story and wants to know what happens next slowing down can build tension because now they're anticipating this climax and what's going to happen to those characters that they've come to care about. It was totally unintuitive to me. I would have always thought, more exciting, more action, speed up. No, that was a great note that I took with me into my performances. Sometimes great intensity slowed down. Hmm. Who's going to program this stuff into the algorithms for auto-reading audiobooks? That, to me, is the kind of thing that is inspiring for really seasoned performers. They make choices that aren't obvious, and those non-obvious choices create some of the art of what they do. If you're basing it off of large models and you've just said, how you know, what's the average... Uh, intense scene rate of increase, because a lot of people read it that way. Is that all you're going to get? Is that intense scenes done the same way over and over again? Because that's what the algorithm tells them is the right way to do it. I can't answer any of these questions. I just find it a fascinating discussion about whether or not this large language model application to automated creation of creative content will move us toward the middle in all the performances and creations, much more efficient, but everything moved toward the middle, or whether they will find a way to figure out that sometimes choices that seem bad on the surface because they don't fit in the middle are the best choices that people can make. And I, I just look back at the movies. The movies I've loved the most are not the ones that just follow the formula. They're ones that break the formula in a new way that really engages you. That's my two cents. Courtney? Yeah, here's a wacky idea. Audible, if you use this idea, I expect a little royalty from it. Uh, you could, uh, since this is going to be all using algorithmically produced uh, uh, text, uh, audio, that, uh, and you're going to have a multiple number of readers sampled, you could cast a book and uh, cast the voices rather than having a single narrator narrate the whole audio book. You could cast it, cast each part that appears in the book with a different voice 
And since the computer's tracking all of this stuff, it can tell what percentage, how many lines each character gets and compensate each each uh, actor that contributed to the training of those voices. So you can have a Meryl Streep and, a, you know, a George Clooney and a Brad Pitt uh, train their voices. Maybe you could even use those in marketing, say, starring the AI voices of Brad Pitt and Meryl Streep, uh, you know. <laughs> What a marketing concept that would be to sell the audiobook versus read by Stephen Fry, somebody, one of the great narrators that's out there. Uh, you know, you could have a, a book narrated by a lot of famous actors using their AI doubles. So you could cast each book. So there's there's an AI and then compensate all the actors that appear. You know. Yeah. The, the one thing that I worry about, and Alex, I think, has, has um, noted something like this. Where are we going to get the next generation of great performers, if all of the early easy work, the stumble around until I figure out how to do it right work, starts getting eaten up by all these automated systems, uh, instead of thousands of qualified narrators, which are out there doing audiobooks right now, today, will we get down to hundreds, dozens? Why? Because they simply couldn't make any money practicing and working them their way up through the ranks. And maybe yeah. at some point you get to the point where you just don't have people doing that work anymore because there's no market for it. And everything starts getting mediocre because of that. I'm not saying it has to be mediocre. Maybe they will find a way to break that through. But that's one of the things that human bring, beings bring to performance is surprise and delight that is part of them being put into their craft. Yeah, but we'll Bill, see. you could go to the estates of a lot of dead famous actors like Ruth Gordon. Who wouldn't like to have Ruth Gordon narrate some little old lady in their in their uh, story or Orson Welles or you know. Yeah, but my point is that you don't get the next their estates. Their estates. You don't get the next Orson Welles or the next Ruth Gordon. You uh, get you, you nobody. Get the real Orson I know, but that's that means we're better. frozen in a model from of dead people. And maybe that's what we want. Maybe we want James yeah. Earl Jones. But you can't rest market. His soul. You can't market a new person because they don't have a reputation. Well, and there you go. But then you don't let people, new people, in. You got to then you got to be so unusually talented that you only get the top one tenth of one percent of people who can make a living at it. And that I'm, I'm wondering if that destroys an industry. I don't know. I'm not prognosticating here. I'm just wondering. Uh, let's get one more question at least before we get to our guest. All right. Our own Jesse Kaster in Glendale writes in, I took some stills with the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema camera and they were saved as B-RAW or a Blackmagic RAW instead of DNG. New firmware seems to make this standard across all PCCs. Is there an easy way to convert these files or to use photo editing software? Jesse, you want to start out? Uh, yeah, as if the stills button on the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema camera needed another reason to be useless. Now you can't even open the files in Photoshop when you shoot. Um, Jason, what have you got for me, if anything? Jason. Uh, I could have sworn that the Adobe Digital Negative Converter, like that standalone version of it, will actually do that. Will, will actually do it now. You do have to install um, the Blackmagic Camera app. Um, but once that's in there, it'll it'll put in the piece that should allow you to read it and convert it and and just automate it using that standalone uh, digital negative converter. There we go. Let's get to one more question because I love this question. Mark Steele in Orlando, Florida, writes in with the passing of the legendary James Earl Jones. What are the panelists' thoughts on his licensing rights to his voice for future Star Wars works back in 2022? Yeah, I think he's in a category pretty much by himself. I mean, there, there are people who were just literally had such an impact on things that I think this is appropriate, particularly since his family is making up for him. He was a signature performer through the course of his career, had one of the best voices we have ever heard and knew how to use it and uh, could bring characters to life in such an extraordinary way. I think we were all saddened by the passage because almost anybody who's ever watched a Star Wars movie uh, was so impressed with the character that he managed to create through his voice in Darth Vader. And and that's just one of the things he did. I remember him, his little cameo in Field of Dreams and the gravity that he brought to that character on screen. So he was just such a signature talent that 
it, it's a loss, but the fact that his work can go through a legal process and, and continue to be useful, I think is useful. Jesse, you had something you want to say about that? I mean, yeah. Um, rest in peace. What, what a talent, what an incredible voice and what a, like, an inspirational story over the course of his life. Um, if, if we're just addressing the question, this is actually one of the use cases for AI that I think is really appropriate. Um, and that's because the character himself has kind of a robotic nature to him. And the delivery of the lines was steady i don't want to say flat but it was steady throughout all of the all of the films so this is a, a, an instance where i do believe that an ai could accurately replicate the the performance uh to a t so uh, good on him for licensing it i'm sure it's going to pay residuals to his family long after his death and uh let's see how it goes this could be a good use of ai in film corny can you do it in 15 and uh, he will probably be hearing his voice as, this is CNN, if you listen to that news network. Yeah. You'll probably hear him for a long time. Perfect for Star Wars because we never saw him. They don't have to make him look younger from year to year. <laughs> That's right. Absolutely. Uh, don't forget that... Um all the regular uh, shows are coming up this week, and we've got all sorts of stuff online Saturday and Sunday for uh, the more uh, light-hearted discussion. And we'll be right back with a guest. 